Well, good morning. Welcome to church. Man, it's good to be in God's house together today. If you're here for the first time, welcome. We're so excited that you're here with us today. Would you let us know that this is your first time here by taking that card in the front of your seat and filling that out? Uh, We'd love to know that you're here for the first time. You can hand it to somebody at the help uh, desk on your way out today. But uh, this is the second week, not only of our Heaven series, but also of our three-week challenge. And so next week is going to be amazing. We're going to have a baptism service, and uh, it's going to be awesome. You're not going to want to miss it. But if you've never been baptized and you want to get baptized, you still have a chance to get baptized next week if you'd like. But you got to act fast because we only have one more in-person uh, first steps baptism class at 1245 today, and then we have one online. So you better uh, look into that and sign up for that. But um, we'd love to get you baptized. Well, church, um, let's just go to the Lord in prayer right now. Let's just set our hearts and our affections on Christ. Father, we just uh, we want to thank you right now. We want to thank you that you are Emmanuel, that you are God with us. I want to thank you that you're here with us right now. You said we're two or three are gathered in your name. There you are in our midst. And your people have come to worship you. Your people have gathered to sing your praise, to pray to you, Father. And we're here to lift up your holy name. Great is your name. You are great and greatly to be praised, Lord. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. We just magnify your name, the name above all names, the name of Jesus, our healer, our Savior, our Lord, our King, our righteousness, our peace, our forgiveness. We thank you for the blood of Jesus today that made a way for us to enter in to your presence to boldly approach your throne, to obtain mercy and find grace in our help of need. We call upon that name, the name above all names. There is no other name by which we must be saved. We speak the name of Jesus right now over every person. Father, speak to us today as we open your word, as we worship you and you seek your face. Lord, let your presence and glory increase in this place. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Come on, let's worship together. Let's give him our praise today. He shames every idol. And he reigns with our rival. And he goes by the name of Jehovah. Jehovah. He speaks into nothing. And darkness goes running Goes by the name of Jehovah Jehovah Call the name Call the name We call the name Jehovah All our praise All our praise Silent. He's fighting for Zion. There's no other God like Jehovah. Jehovah, His arm never tired. His eyes are like fire. There's no Praise, all our praise, all our praise, 
praise you for who you are, Lord. Jehovah Nisi fights your battles. Jehovah Nisi fights your battles. He's your victory today. Jehovah Nisi fights your battles. Yes, he does. Jehovah Nisi fights your battles. Jehovah Nisi fights your battles. Jehovah Jireh meets your needs. Jehovah Rapha heal your body. Jehovah Shalom be your peace. Yeah. Jehovah Nisi fights your battles. Jehovah Jireh meets your needs. Every need. Jehovah Rapha heal your body. Jehovah Shalom be your peace. Jehovah Nisi fights your battles. Jehovah Jireh meets your needs. Yes, He does. Jehovah Rapha heal your body. Jehovah Shalom be your peace. We call the name. Call the name. Call the name. Jehovah, in all our praise, come on, in all our praise, yes, all our praise belongs to Him. Call the name, call the name, call the name, Jehovah, all our praise, all our praise, all our praise belongs to Him. shepherd your mercy leads back to your arms where I'm meant to be so I thank you Jesus for finding me for saving thank you Jesus for saving me you took my place on that cursed tree died for sin but rose as a king so i thank you jesus for saving me it's only because
feel this together. So I enter the gates of the Lord with thanksgiving. I enter the courts of the Lord with praise. I enter the gates of the Lord with thanksgiving. I enter the courts of the Lord. Come on, give him praise. church so good to be able to just declare that together to set our hearts on Jesus and just when we're faced with him just say thank you thank you for loving us thank you for who you are before I invite you to have a seat if you would please just move towards the center of your section we still have families who want to come in and worship with us today and we want them to be able to join us so if you have space towards the center of your section just make space on the ends for them to be great and then as you do that you can have a seat And just as we continue in worship, when you came in, you should have been handed elements to be able to take communion together. And it's an opportunity in scripture where it calls those who have crossed that line of faith, believers, to be able to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made. So if you didn't get those elements, you can throw up a hand and guest services would love to help you out. But as we have this time today to focus in on this, I think it's always important for us to take a step back and just look at context. Because one of the main places we get instruction for how to take communion is in 1 Corinthians 11. And when you look at the context of what was happening here, when Paul wrote this letter to Corinth, they were having these gatherings. They were having fellowship. They were breaking bread together. But they weren't acknowledging Christ. They were forgetting to do exactly what we're called to do when we take communion. Remember the body. Remember the blood. Remember the foundation of our faith. Don't just blindly get together and follow a tradition. And if you've been coming to Westridge, we do communion every month. We're faithful to do it on a regular basis. But if we're not careful, we can tend to do the same thing and follow those motions. And, oh, this is that time. Oh, this is the time when we sing. I'm just, I kind of know this song. I'll just kind of sing it. Oh, this is where they give the little cups. Okay, yeah, you open this, then you do this. But the the careful instruction that you read in 1 Corinthians 11 is actually to make sure our hearts are in the right posture. That's why he's writing to them is to say, hey, don't miss this. It's an opportunity to remember, acknowledge, and praise God for the body and blood. So I wanted to give us space because sometimes you just need to be able to refocus your heart because you can go through those motions without even realize you're doing it. But to have those moments to just pause and go, this is why. So you can get those elements out. You can even go ahead and peel that first layer back as we get ready to take that wafer that represents the body of Christ. It represents this fulfillment of a prophecy that was in Isaiah that said, by his stripes, you are healed. 
that God's word says that he was bruised, beaten, broken on our behalf. He took a punishment that we deserved, but he freely chose it. And so when we have a moment right now, we're just going to pray together before we take it. We pray this together. God, open our eyes to see all that you accomplished through your body. May your spirit just remind our souls how good you are, how kind you are, how much you love us, that you took our punishment. And Jesus felt every bit of it. So today we thank you and we praise you for the body. And we can take that together. And then as you're ready, you can go ahead and peel that second layer back. And even seeing the juice that's in the cup, it helps you even just to focus in on something, just to look at that. And remember the blood that Jesus shed on our behalf. This, even this concept that there was a sacrificial system in place. That sacrifice, a blood sacrifice needed to be made to atone for sin to help bridge that gap that was between man and God. And then because of what Jesus did, the pure and perfect sacrifice, his blood was the perfect atonement, ending the need for a sacrificial system. And this juice that's in this little cup that we're about to take together allows us to be in right standing with the Father. It called, he says that that's our righteousness. And what an incredible thing that is. So God... As we take this juice today, may we remember the blood of Jesus. May your spirit open our eyes to all that's within that because it's so powerful. To know that in our depravity and our sin, because of the blood of Jesus, we are washed clean and you call us righteous. So we thank you and we praise you for the blood. And we can take that together. The whole point of this communion is to keep our eyes, hearts, and minds focused in on Jesus. So as you finish taking communion, I invite you to stand with us because we're just going to keep our attention and our affection on Him as we sing and as we praise Him for his story from birth to heaven we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus in the darkness we were waiting without hope, without light. Till from heaven you came running. There was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets. To a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt.
so much. I'm going to tell you what, it just does my heart so good when I'm, I'm sitting over here, I look back and so many of you are engaged, so many of you have your hands raised, you're singing, just coming into this place in awe and reverence of God. Thank you for that. It just inspires me. I love to see it. Um, yesterday, I was a bit uh, disengaged from the news. I like to keep up with what's going on around the world, around our country, and uh, Amy's birthday was yesterday, so I kind of disengaged from all that so I could focus on her. And um, happy birthday, by the way. And, um, but, I, but I did notice uh, late last night and then early again this morning that um, the, the nation of Israel was under attack by the nation of Iran. And um, there were over 300 missiles and drones that were fired at Israel. And uh, the United States and the UK and even Jordan were knocking those out of the air. Uh, but as you know, and as you think about this, this could become a larger situation, and, and um, that's not a good thing. And, uh, but the Bible does tell us to be praying for Jerusalem, and uh, we've talked about Israel quite a bit up, uh, up here over the last several months. So I just want to take a moment and pray for Israel. I want to pray for the Middle East. I want to pray for our country right now, so let's do that. Father, I pray right now for the, the nation of Israel. Your eyes are on the Middle East. You tell us to pray for Jerusalem, the peace of Jerusalem. Um, Lord, you love the people of the Middle East. You love the people of Israel. And we pray today for protection over that nation. Uh, we pray against their enemies, Lord, that uh, they would not prosper. Um, we pray, Father, for wisdom for our leaders. And uh, we, we ask you, Lord, that this would not escalate um, beyond what has already happened. Uh, but uh, we pray for protection uh, over, over that nation, over the nation of Israel. And, uh, and we pray for not only peace in Jerusalem, but for peace in the Middle East. And we pray that you will protect innocent people today. And uh, we give you all the praise and glory um, for the fact that you're on the throne and you're in control with all authority. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, I want you to get your Bibles turned to the book of John. It feels kind of weird not to say turn to the book of Mark, but... Um, here we are in the book of John for just a, just a Sunday. We're in, a t we're in week two of our series on the topic of heaven. And uh, I'm going to tell you, Pastor J.P. Morgan did a great job last week kicking us off. Uh, when I asked John to speak, I said, I said John, I, I, just, I need you to do three things. I gave him three objectives. I said, I need you to put a bow on the book of Mark. I need you to get Jesus into heaven, which the book of Mark does. And then I need you to describe what he's doing. And the man brought it. So I'm so grateful uh, that when I'm not here, uh, we have some great communicators that really, really help us out. Uh, we were, Amy and I were la uh, in Avonport, uh, Davenport, Iowa last week watching some really, really cold baseball. Uh, our oldest son coaches there, so we were there, and, um, but so good to be back home uh, here this morning. Um, back in 2004, uh, when my dad passed away at the age of 59, I spent countless days thinking about heaven. I had so many questions. I wanted to know what my dad was doing up there. I wanted to know what he was, what he was thinking. Was he thinking about us? I wanted to know who he was hanging out with. I, wanted to, I just wanted to know, did he miss us? I wanted to know, did he know how sad we were down here that he was gone? So I started rereading passages of scripture on heaven, just trying to gain some, some new insight. And that same year in 2004, um, an author by the name of, of Randy Elkhorn wrote a book called Heaven that really completely opened my eyes to some things in the Bible that, it, that um, I had really never considered about heaven, things that I had never really heard of or even really thought of before, and, and I'm going to reference that book throughout this series along with some other books that, that I've been reading on this topic. But, you know, it's interesting. Heaven is somewhat of a mystery, isn't it? I mean, it's amazing how little we really do know about this place where most of us are going to spend eternity. And it's even more amazing to me uh, the amount of unbiblical teaching and thinking that there is around this topic. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to lie to you. Before 2004, I imagined heaven as this never-ending church service where we just sang and worshiped around the throne of, of God for all of eternity. And I mean, here's the thing. I grew up in church. I went to Bible college. I went to seminary. I'd been a pastor for a, quite a few years up until this point. But I grew up hearing pastors describe this never-ending worship event um, with tremendous enthusiasm and all this flowery verbiage, and, and, I, and I would shake my head in agreement, but inside, with much guilt, I thought, I must be really unspiritual because 
I don't know if I can handle that kind of eternity. And, and I, know I'll, I know I'll have a different mindset when I get to heaven and, and we'll all be free from the, the curse of sin. So I'll love it, but I would think, man, there has to be more to it than that. It's certainly better than the alternative, which is an eternity in hell. But man, I don't know if I can handle a, that kind of church. Like, that's a lot of church, right? Have you ever thought that one of the reasons why so many people who claim to be Christians really struggle with their faith is because they don't have a clear understanding of heaven and and eternity. It's really hard to look forward to an eternity that doesn't really sound appealing or that you just don't understand. Well, here's the good news. Heaven is more amazing and more incredible than we could ever imagine. Now, here's a little warning. Over the next few weeks, uh, I'm going to say some things that I think are going to stretch some of you a little bit. And you may disagree with me on a few things, but that's okay, okay? Because my goal is to get you thinking about heaven. I want to challenge you to get a new perspective and to get a new excitement about what God has in store for those who truly are his children. And throughout this series, my approach will be to pose a lot of questions and then attempt to answer them with scripture. Well, today I'm just going to lay out, I'm going to lay out some basic truths about heaven I'm going to answer some really basic questions. What is heaven? When will we go to heaven? And then who will be in heaven? And so I'm calling this morning Heaven 101. This is foundational stuff. Um, Next week and the week to follow, next week's going to be a big baptism week, so not probably going to teach as much, but we're still going to be talking about heaven. Um, But I'm going to kind of start diving into the deep end over the next several weeks. But before we do that, we need to lay some foundation. So this is Heaven 101. In 2004, a few, week, a few months before my dad died, I had the privilege of traveling with some, some pastor friends to one of the uh, oldest civilizations that's still in, ex- in existence today, um, the, the nation of Egypt. I had a chance to, I saw the Sphinx, I, I rode a camel, I visited the Cairo Museum, I saw some dead mummies, what else would they be but dead, and, and, I, and I visited... Um, the pyramids, I had a chance to visit with the Grand Imam, which is really cool. But really, it's about 6,000 years of ancient history right there. But one of the most fascinating discoveries about the pyramids is the, the hieroglyphic inscriptions that teach us about the culture, the lifestyle, and the beliefs of the ancient Egyptians. And one of the most famous hieroglyphics is the Last Judgment of Hunifer, which is found in the Book of the Dead that dates back to 1275 BC. This is actually a picture of that. This is nearly 3,300 years old. Now, this hieroglyphic is so important because it reveals what the ancient Egyptians believed about eternity for thousands of years. This is what they believed. They believed that my life is ultimately accountable to God. They also believed that my life on earth is preparation for my life in eternity. And they believed that my eternity is based upon God's acceptance of my life. This belief in life after death and eternity is not unique to the Egyptians. Pastor Randy Elkhorn, author Randy Elkhorn says, the unifying testimony of the human heart throughout history is belief in life after death. Anthropological um, evidence suggests that every culture has a God-given innate sense of the eternal. That is this world, that this world is not all there is. So where does this universal belief in life after death come from? Well, in the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon writes this, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 11, he says, he has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. The word eternity here means time without end. Pastor Tony Evans says humanity is intention. We live in the routine of time, but our hearts are designed to long for something more. And this longing for something more is not just true of ancient civilizations. We were all created with, by God with this sense that there is something else beyond this life. Now, not everybody agrees that this something is a place called heaven, but a majority of people, even in our own country, still believe this to be true. A Gallup poll in May of 2023 revealed that 67% of Americans still believe in a place called heaven. That's actually down um, from where it was at 83% in uh, uh, 2001. But here's the point. 
every civilization from the beginning of time to today has believed that there is life after death. The question then is, what is that life going to be like? Here's what Randy Elkhorn says. He says, we should accept that many things about heaven are secret and that God has countless surprises in store for us. But as for the things God has revealed to us about heaven, these things belong to us. In other words, we have something better than hieroglyphics or even Gallup polls. We have the word of God. And so for today, you can clap, that's good. So for today, we are going to start off with some red letter words from Jesus himself. Now, let me give you a little background before we get into John 14. In, in Luke's, or excuse me, in the Apostle John's account of the Last Supper, after Jesus had shared a last meal with his disciples, and then he had predicted the, uh, Judas's betrayal and then Peter's denial, Jesus began to talk to his disciples about what was going to happen to him after he died. And he begins by sharing with them a very brief but very powerful lesson on heaven. So let's begin in verse 1. He says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, he says, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also, and you know the way to where I'm going. Now, at this point, Thomas wasn't so sure about what Jesus was talking about, so he asks Jesus a question, and he says, Lord, we we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There are three important questions about heaven that I want to answer here today. And here's the first question. Question number one, what is it? What is heaven? Heaven, first of all, is a real place. Pastor Chip Ingram writes this. He says, heaven is not a theoretical concept of state of mind. It is not make-believe or pretend or a fragment of somebody's imagination. Just like Miami and London and Tokyo are actual places, heaven is real and it's an actual place place. So how can we be sure of that? Well, let's, we need to look at what Jesus said. We need to look at the words he spoke. Three words that Jesus used. Twice in, uh, in verses two through three, Jesus calls heaven a place. The word place here that Jesus uses, all right, in these verses means a definite spot in a city, a district, or a country. It refers to a very specific place where something is done, where something takes place. You say, how do you know that, Brian? Well, because every other time this word is used in the, in the New Testament, it refers to a literal place. We get the word topography from this same Greek word used in these verses. Jesus also uses the word house in verse Two, this same word is used 73 times in the New Testament. 70 times it refers to an actual physical house. It is referred to as a real place where real people actually live together. And then Jesus says this. He says, in my Father's house are many rooms. These rooms are actual places where real people dwell or live. Pastor W.A. Criswell says, there are some who say heaven is a state of mind, a dream, an idea, wishful thinking, or a sentiment, but Jesus calls it a place as real as the home in which you live and city in which you dwell. We can be sure that, that, that heaven is a real place because of the words that Jesus is speaking here. But we can also be sure because of the way he spoke them. Now, there's a little typo in my notes. That's my fault, all right? Now, if you've ever heard me do a funeral before, I often use John chapter 14 as my text. Why? Because it's just very comforting. And Jesus starts off verse 1 with these words. He's looking at his disciples. He says, guys, let not your hearts be troubled. Now, why would the disciples' hearts be troubled? I mean, they're sitting around having a meal with Jesus, they're, having a t- they're just talking with him. Well, because Jesus had told them in chapter 13 that he was leaving them and that, and that they couldn't go to where he was going until later on. They would follow him later on. And the disciples, as Jesus is teaching them, looking that they have worry written all over their faces. They're confused. And so Jesus says to them, guys, don't worry. Don't worry. Trust me. He says in John 14, 1, he says, believe in God, believe also in me. In other words, just as you trust in God the Father, he says, 
put all of your trust in me. Why? Because the Father and I are one in divine nature and in purpose. And so because of that, guys, you can trust me. So heaven is a real place because heaven is spoken of in such a, an amazing way by Jesus. But it's also a real place because heaven is a real place prepared by God. That's number two. Verse two, in my Father's house, Jesus says, are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? Now, there's a lot of misunderstanding and even some confusion around that statement. Here's the wrong way to interpret what Jesus just said. Now, this would be the wrong way. For the last 2,000 years, Jesus has been up in heaven with a hammer, nail, and saw, and he has just been building you a place. Like Jesus is Bob the Builder or Tim the Toolman Taylor. I mean, he's, heaven's just this ongoing construction pro, 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 uh, project. And every time someone, you know, like you get saved, God goes, hey, Jesus, get busy building another house. There's another one coming up here. There's a, there, this is where a little Greek comes into play, okay? The word prepare is used in the aorist tense. What does that mean? It means that it's past tense. It was a past tense action. Why is that important? Because everything that needs to be done to prepare a place for us in heaven is finished. So heaven is a real place prepared by God, number three, to be with his people forever. Look at verse three again. And Jesus says, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. And here's what this means. Jesus is saying where he is and continues to be forever, there you will be and continue to be forever. Now, what will that look like? Well, that's where we're going to be in the next several weeks. But let me allow the words of Pastor Chip Ingram to whet your appetite just a bit. Ready? He says, contrary to popular culture in the last five movies about heaven, we're not going to be floating in clouds wearing white robes playing harps. Praise God. Heaven is very tangible and real. The world we now live in is an old earth that is fallen, but there is coming a new heaven and a new earth that is as real and physical and tangible as this earth. There will be activity and work to be done. We will be productive. There will be adventure and new experiences. We will learn, work, and create. Songs will be written. Art, music, and culture will be created as we continue to learn of the infinite wisdom and glory of God. Think about the most spectacular sunset you've ever witnessed. Think about your favorite place to vacation. Think about the greatest adventure you've ever been on. Think about your favorite memory with your kids. The new heaven and the new earth will be all of that and so much more. We got to get excited about that. That's what we're going to be talking about over the next several weeks. Here's the second question. When will we go to heaven? Well, if you're a Christian, you will go to heaven one of two ways, either through death or through the air. I would prefer the air, but death, if it come, that, we're all guaranteed to die, right? Tomorrow, you're, you pay your taxes tomorrow, and then one day you die. Okay, so two things. Jesus says in verse 3, he says, I will come again and will take you to myself. Now, what is Jesus talking about here? He's talking about the rapture. In January... We spent two weeks discussing this event in our Mark series. This is where Jesus will return to receive his followers and take them to heaven. This will happen before he returns to earth to establish his millennial kingdom. Now listen to how the apostle Paul describes this event in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. He says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Now, man, this is going to be quite an event. This is going to be quite an event. Jesus is going to come down from heaven with a shout, with a, with a, with a sound of a trumpet. Where else do we see in Scripture Jesus shouting? When he called a dead man named Lazarus to come up out of the grave, Jesus was shouting and Lazarus 
walked out alive. When Jesus comes back, he is going to shout again, and graves are going to start opening. Bodies, regardless of what form they are currently in, are going to start coming back together to be united with soul and spirit of those who will be coming with Jesus in this rapture moment. And Paul says that those who are still alive on earth will ascend and join these brothers and sisters in Christ, and we will meet them in the clouds. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, that all of this is going to happen in a flash in the twinkling of an eye. Now, let this just soak into your mind for just a moment. I just want you just to imagine what this is going to, what this is going to be like. So often, because I grew up in church, I grew up with hymns, I'm obviously a little older, I, when, sometimes when I'm writing sermons, I start thinking about hymns. And I'm going to tell you what I was thinking about when I just got to this point. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that's going to be. When we all see Jesus, we're going to do what? We're going to sing and shout the victory. If you'll stick around to the end of the service today, we're going to sing that. Okay, that's, that's some incentive not to leave and go to lunch early. Okay? In the next few weeks, we're going to discuss in detail what the Bible says about what part of us goes to heaven when we die, what will happen to our bodies in, in, the, in the rapture, and what this current uh, state of heaven looks like. So you don't want to miss it. You don't want to miss any weeks of these series. Here's the third question. Who will be in heaven? Well, we know there's going to be angels in heaven. Revelation chapter 5, verse 11, the apostle John is having a dream on the Isle of Patmos. He says, then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels numbering myriads and myriads and thousands and thousands. What's a myriad? It means, it means 10,000. The Apostle John saw myriads of myriads. That means a minimum of 100 million angels. Contrary to, 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 to what Hollywood has portrayed, we don't become angels when we, when, when we get to heaven. We don't get a set of wings, even though, I, like again, that would be really cool, right? But there's going to be a lot of angels there. There's also going to be people. There's going to be people in heaven. But what people? Which people? Well, this is where it gets interesting. According to, to an ABC News poll, 75, 75% of Americans believe that they will go to heaven. According to a 2021 Pew Research poll, 58% of the Christians they surveyed in this poll believe that many religions can lead to eternal life in heaven. Within this group, 43% believe that members of some non-Christian religions can attain eternal life in heaven. That means that nearly half of people who call themselves Christians believe that there are many ways to get to heaven. In other words, these people believe that the door to heaven is wide and there are many ways to get in. Several years ago, uh, when I was living in New Jersey in the eight, uh, late 1980s, early 1990s, I, I was talking to... Uh, an older man who became a really good friend of mine, a guy by the name of Al Oldham, he was the, the, the chairman of the board of the seminary that I was attending in, in Philadelphia at the time. And he and I were discussing um, Christianity in the northeast part of our country. And he, he's one of the smartest guys that I've ever met on the topic, not only of the Bible, but just of, of spiritual history across our nation, especially uh, the northeast part of our country. And we were talking about just the great revivals that took place in the Northeast, you know, the Great Awakening and, and in the early, um, early to mid-1700s. And, and, and we were talking about just the impact that it had on our nation. And I asked him, I said, why do you think that the Northeast is right now so unchurched and so lost? I mean, literally, it's become post-Christian. And he answered with one word. And by the way, I think in some places in the north, it's almost pre-Christian today. But he answered with one word. He said, here's, here's why I believe it. It, it is the way it is. Universalism. Universalists believe in universal salvation. They believe that, that the God of love would never create a person knowing that that person would be destined for eternal damnation. So they conclude that all people must be destined for salvation. Now, there are a lot of universalists who deny the existence of a literal place called hell. And according to my friend Al Oldham and many others, that belief system swept through the Northeast shortly after the First Great Awakening, which would have been probably in the late 1700s, 
and it snuffed out the fires of a revival in the northeast part of our country. And, and it's still a growing movement in our, not only our country, but in our world today. I know people who used to come to Westridge Church who were believers in what we're talking about here today, but left here and now embrace this universalistic theology. You say, how do you respond to that? You respond with the words of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 7, here's what Jesus says. He says, you can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad and its gate is wide for many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is narrow and the road is difficult and only a few ever find it. Jesus talks very clearly about the reality of a real place called heaven and a real place called hell. He says that there is a narrow way to get into heaven and, and it's broad and it's wide, it's a wide way to get into hell. And many people are choosing, they're choosing the broad and wise, wide path. That broad and wide path represents ma man's attempt to make himself acceptable to a holy God. And it's called religion. And religion comes in many different names. I just mentioned universalism. Religion is a highway to hell. But Jesus mentions a gateway to life, and he says, the gateway to life is narrow, it's difficult, and few people find it. In other words, not everyone is going to be in heaven. So how can we know for sure that we know the way to get to heaven? Well, let's go back for just a moment to Thomas's question to Jesus in John chapter 14, verse 5, because Jesus answers this as plainly and as forthrightly as you could possibly answer a question. Thomas says to him, he says, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus says to him, he says, Thomas, don't miss this. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And here's what Jesus is saying to Thomas. He says to Thomas, the way to heaven is not a path, it's not a road, it's not a map, it's not a church, it's not a set of morals, it's not a background, it's not good works, it's not a religion. None of these things are the way. Jesus says, only those who put their faith and their trust in him alone in this life will go to heaven. He is not a way, he is the only way. He is... He is the universal access point to God. There is no other entrance into heaven. If you want to know the Father, you must come to him through the Son. Now, some of you may be sitting here thinking, or if you're watching at home, you're thinking, Brian, are you saying that only Christians can go to heaven? That like everyone else, everyone else, Muslims, Buddhists, Mormons, Jewish people, Jehovah's Witnesses, Hindus, atheists, they're all going to hell? Here's what I'm telling you. I'm telling you that Jesus says that, the only, that, 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 that only those who put their faith and their trust in him alone in this life will go to heaven. Let me tell you what that means. That means that anyone can come to faith in Jesus. There are a lot of people who call themselves Christians who are putting their faith in, their, in, in religion or in their own good works to make themselves right with God, hoping that they're going to make it to heaven. And Jesus says not only, Jesus not only calls this a broad gate that leads to destruction, but he directs us to the narrow gate that he says leads to life. He says, I am the gate. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. So there's going to be angels in heaven. And there's going to be people in heaven. People who have come through Jesus, they're going to be there. But there's one more person who will be in heaven. And to be quite honest, without him, it's just not heaven. Jesus is going to be in heaven. In John chapter 4, verse 3, Jesus says, that's where I am, you may be also. That where I am, you may be also. Today, listen, when we think about heaven, we live by faith, right? I mean... None of us have ever been to heaven and come back. I, I don't think anybody in here has had that experience. If you have, you've probably written a book or there's a movie about you or something like that. But, but, today, but one day, we're going to live by sight because we're going to see Jesus face to face. And we're going to live with him forever in a real place called heaven. I love these words of, of um, Johnny Erickson Tata. 
She says, Jesus, who is at the very center of heaven, is what makes it exciting to me. We have something like a homing detector in our hearts, and it's just not ringing for the earth. It's ringing for him in whom our deepest longings will be answered. So heaven is not just a place, it's a person, and that individual for whom we were made for. Mm. Can't wait to see Jesus. How about you? I can't wait to see my dad. I can't wait to see my grandparents. I got cousins up there. I got aunts, uncles up there. A lot of friends up there. People who have called this their church home, they're there. Can't wait to see it. But man, I can't wait to look at Jesus. I have been talking about Jesus all my life. I can't wait to lay my eyes on him physically. And my question to you is, do you know him? Uh, Not that you know about him. Do you know him personally? Is he your savior? Is he your Lord? Have you received him into your life? Will you be in heaven? If, If the thought is, man, I hope so. The Bible says you can know. Really, where does it say that? 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Wouldn't you like to know for sure? I, I talk to people a lot, even people who, who tell me about a salvation experience or something like that, who, and I'll, I'll say, hey, tell me about that. Tell me about your relationship with Jesus and about your, your eternity in heaven. And they're like, man, I hope I'm going. Really? Well, how do you think you're going to get there? And even though they've heard the truth, they'll still go back to this, well, I hope I'm good enough or I hope I'm, you know, I've done enough. And they'll talk about the, you know, the morals of their life and how, maybe how they're better than so-and-so or whatever. And I'm like, no, that's not going to get you there. That is religion. The only way you can know for sure that you're going to heaven is Jesus. If we could get to heaven in our own good works, then there would be no need for Jesus. Jesus came to stand in our place on a cross, came up out of the grave, not only to give us victory over sin, but victory over death. And the only way that you can know for sure that you're going to heaven is by placing your faith and your trust in Jesus, in what he has done for you, what he's accomplished for you. And so some of you, you you may in your mind be thinking, man, I I hope I can go. I I think I'll go. I'm not really sure. Let's get that settled. Let's get that settled. Before we talk anything more about heaven, let's get that settled. So I want you to bow your head for just a, a moment. If you're here today and you've never put your faith and your trust in Jesus, who says this, with his own words. I am the only way. I am the truth, the life. You cannot come to the Father except through me. Pray with me right now. Say, Lord, right now, I place my faith in Jesus, the way, the truth, the life. Father, I want to know you personally. God the Father, I want to know you personally. I want things to be made right between me and you. Jesus says the only way that that can happen is through him. And so today I put all of my faith and all of my trust in Jesus and what he has done for me on a cross. Lord, forgive me of my sin. Forgive me of any other thought that I may have had of how I would come to you, including my own righteousness or my own good works. Today I humble my heart repent of my sins. I put all of my faith and my trust in Jesus alone. Jesus, you're the son of God, the savior of the world. Forgive me of my sins. Help me to know what it means to walk with you. If you're praying that with me right now, I want you to get out the Get Connected card in the seat pocket in front of you. I want you to fill it out. Check the box that says, today I prayed to receive Jesus Christ as my savior. I want you to either put it in the bucket as you walk out the door or take it to the help center. We want to help you to take a next step. Next week, we're going to be um, baptizing, man, a lot of people. People from 
who got saved at Easter, people from before that, maybe some of you. There's a class we'd love you to take called First Steps. It tells you all about that. But we just want you to, we want you to take a next step. Baptism is a public declaration of what just happened in your life. If you want to wait on that, that's fine. But just let us know today that you made that decision. Here's the other thing I want to ask you to do. If, if you're not excited about, you're, you're, you're a Christian, you're a Christ follower, but you just sit in there thinking, you know, I'm just really not excited about heaven. As I think about it, it's just, I don't know, I don't really think about it much at all. Ask yourself, why is that? Is there something in this life, in this world, that has grabbed your attention, your heart, that maybe has just become the, a God to you, an idol to you, or something in your life that you're like, man, there's something on this earth that's so appealing, so great, whatever it is. I'm going to tell you, it, is, it pairs in comparison to what heaven's going to be like for us. And our hearts and our minds need to be there. They need to be focused on that, on eternity. We need to be living our lives for eternity. So just take a moment right now before we sing. And I just want you to say, Lord, all this other stuff that my heart is so into and focused into, Lord, none of this, just it just pales in comparison to what you have for me in heaven. Help put my, put my hope there. If you put something in front of God in your life, just have a moment of repentance. Let's get excited as a church about what God's prepared for those who love him. Lord, help all of us to live our lives for an eternal purpose with heaven in mind. We thank you for all that you're doing in our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. So I told you, don't leave. I want you to stand. Let's sing about heaven. Let's sing about heaven. I want you to lean in. Sing it like you mean it. Westridge, you're loved. To breathe the air of heaven Pain is gone And mercy fills the street To look upon the one who bled to save me and walk with him for all eternity. There will be a day. There will be a day when all will bow before him. There will be a day when death will be no more. Standing face to face.
together we sing when we all get to end what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all sing Jesus will see and shout the victory starts our week off right, so that's awesome. Um, just a couple of things before you go. Uh, we never want to end our services without giving you the opportunity to extend your worship with your uh, giving of your tithes and your offerings. Um, and so we have three ways for you to give. In 2 Corinthians 9, um, I love the passage that says that those who, who sow sparingly will reap sparingly. Those who sow generously will reap generously. And it goes on to tell us that we are not to give with under compulsion or not to give out of some sort of obligation, but to give out of a cheerful heart because God loves a cheerful giver. Can we just say that together? God loves a cheerful giver. And with your generosity, um, you know, I know some people like to know, like, well, where's the money going? <laughs> so, so with your generosity, the things that West Ridge Church is able to do in this community to be a light to families who don't know Jesus is absolutely incredible. And one of those incredible things that we do every year is our annual Night of the Stars special needs prom that's coming up. Always such a good event. And so if you're cheering, it probably means that you're already signed up to help, yes? <laughs> so if you're not cheering, guess what you get to do today? Sign up to help. And so we have we have one more week left of our um, sign-ups where you can go online and you can register to help us with that. And where we were this morning, I checked with Anita Metcalf, who is the leader of that event, and her team uh, that helps to pull that thing off. But it takes hundreds of people. And this year, we have actually expanded our registrations to over two. 200 attendees. So it's going to be wall to wall people, wall to wall dancing and fun, all of the things. Um, and so we, because of that, we need a one on one dance partner with every single person that's invited to attend. And this morning, we still had 35 participants that don't have a one on one. So we need 35 people before you leave this room to sign up to be buddies. And then additionally, on that Friday during the day, we still need about 20 people for our setup team. So if you have the gift of hospitality and you love just coming into a space and setting it up and praying over chairs and tables and setting centerpieces and decor and that's your thing, then sign up to come and help um, during the day. And then we also need about uh, 15 more hair and makeup people. So if you are great with that sort of thing, we need you because we've got 60 girls that are going to descend on this place to get their hair and their makeup done on Friday between 11 and 3. And so there's all all sorts of places where you can get plugged into that. You do have to have your background check done by this Friday. So make sure that you get signed up today. So here's two challenges. Pull out your phone, go ahead and type in the website that you have to go. Get yourself registered before you leave today. And I'm going to ask you to text that link to three people that you know like to party because it's going to be the greatest of all parties. I think the only better party is when the angels begin rejoicing when somebody says yes to Jesus. Amen. 
All right. Well, let me just speak a blessing over you this morning. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you as he gives you peace. You are dismissed.